gentlemen, this is Tuesday, September 21st, the Cuyahoga County Public Safety and Justice Affairs Committee meeting. Roll call, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Before, before I call the roll, I just want to say as a reminder to all in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county YouTube page. Calling the roll, Mr. Gallagher. Here. Ms. Conwell is absent. If we want to excuse her absence, she's on vacation. Mr. Tuma. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Ms. Simon is absent at the moment. And she is on her way. Yes. Uh, public comment? No public comment has been received. Okay. And, and uh, Mr. Chair, yes. would we like to excuse um, Ms. Conwell at this time, her absence? Uh, I don't do that. Okay. I, we don't need to do okay. that. Thank you. Council meeting's different. Um, in your packets, there's the meetings, meeting of July 13th. If they're in order, I'll accept the motion in a second. So move. I'll second, second that. Is there discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'd just like to note my presence for the record. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. And Mr. and Mr. Miller, and as Ms. always. And Ms. Baker. As always. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And and Nan Baker. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, resolution 2021-178. Resolution uh, authorizing a contract with Thales Dis USA Inc. in the amount not to exceed $1,464,358 for hardware and software maintenance and support services for the automated fingerprint identification system. And it's for the period January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2025. You and Dr. Gilson. And then what we'll do after the item will roll right into your presentation so you can uh At the end of last year, we had it installed uh, at the forensic lab. The previous uh, equipment had reached end of life and was shared equipment between uh, the city of Cleveland and our office, but it was housed at Cleveland Public Safety. So the new system is housed at the medical examiner's forensic lab. Uh, this is the contract that will get us um, our maintenance uh, and uh, all the new equipment has been installed already. Um, but this will get us maintenance out for the next five years. All right. Uh, Parenthetically, questions? I'd say uh, this is really a bridge to about five years. The direction that the uh, APHIS system, the fingerprint system is headed is actually to start to tie multiple threads together, including DNA profiles and then facial recognition. A lot of other things will probably come into play, but this was essential to get us out to that point where that technology kind of sorts itself out. Questions? Questions from the committee? And um, this is in and dated January 1st, so we'll move this forward pronto. So if everything's in order, I'll accept a motion for resolution 2021-0178 to the full council under second reading of suspension of the rules. I'll make that motion. And I have a second. Is there a discussion? Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind, may I ask a sure, question? Go ahead. Oh. Uh, I didn't notice the dates until the chair mentioned it. What have we been doing for the last seven or eight months um, without this contract in place for maintenance on the uh, Yes. Uh, this, um, this has been a cascading uh, issue the work that was completed at the end of last year, Thales provided us with an invoice on December 17th. And of course, nobody was in session anymore. 
and it carried over into uh, the beginning of this year, which delayed the new contract. So we had to deal with last year's payments before we could start this one. They didn't get us the new contract until end of first quarter this year. I had, we had a new procurement team coming in and then uh, it took a little back and forth between our legal departments to get the terminology right. And that was sometime midsummer. Uh, we had it uh, scheduled to, uh, to come here and then we hit the break. And um, so it's, it's just kind of cascaded until now. If I may just follow. Um, mm -hmm. have, um, have we been able to use their services even though in the last seven or eight months we haven't officially had a contract? So the, the system is brand new. So there haven't been any mechanical issues that required um, any serious maintenance uh, or things like that. So, uh, but they have been monitoring the system for us, understanding that we've had delays on, on both sides. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything further? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Doctor, you have your uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I, uh, it's good to be here. There's a lot going on that I think our community is seeing. Um, I picked four topics really to talk about. Um, three of them are really community oriented and one's specific to our office. So uh, I know the sheriff is here today, so I don't want to blather endlessly on introductory things. Um, we gave a presentation, which, uh, or I should say uh, just a few PowerPoint slides. I, I don't know if those are in front of you or not. Oh, handout. Okay. That's even better. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, the ongoing issue that we've been dealing with for a long time is our, our drug situation. Um, this is not a good year. Uh, we probably will come close to our record year of 2017, when we had 727 drug overdoses, we're on target to have about that number for 2021. Um, there's always a correction, and I don't want to be the guy who kind of cries wolf every year because I know there's, in the past, we've talked about higher numbers coming through, and then as toxicology got finalized, uh, instead of these screen numbers, they would correct themselves down to lower values. You can see. We had the big spike in 2016, and then things kind of fell back 2018, 19, and 2020, the pandemic year. Uh, this year, uh, I genuinely think the spike is real, and I'll explain the biggest reason why is that green line are fentanyl screens, and fentanyl's the big driver of mortality in our community. So uh, the red line is cocaine, and the screen for cocaine can pick up an inactive metabolite as well as the parent drug. So I think traditionally that was kind of, you know, something that would inflate numbers when we were only reporting out screens. Fentanyl's the real deal. The screen does not bluff. It's generally accurate. I think, you know, with the pandemic reopening of the border uh, with Mexico as well as kind of decreasing restrictions in trade with China, the drugs we're seeing again are fentanyl and the analogs of fentanyl. Uh, I think our goal, you know, should be to sort of batten down the hatches this year, but I, I really don't think getting back to 2018 is really kind of like a real success. If you look back, you know, 2015 and really back to the end of the uh, graph over on the left, we had, you know, substantially fewer homicides, or pardon me, substantially fewer drug overdoses than we did, uh, you know, for the last five years. I don't know what the answer to this is exactly. I think some of the things that are in place in terms of getting the antidote and naloxone out to the community, fentanyl test strips, uh, so that people using drugs, they don't know that they ever really fully appreciate what they're, you know, actually going to use. Those are good risk reduction strategies and. I think, you know, the diversion center is another thing that I'm eager to sort of see open as a means to, you know, just putting people on a different path. Um, 
The next topic I have there is one I would like to devote a pretty large amount of time to. It's uh, gun violence. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Jones, if you could put your microphone on. A few years ago, um, local Cleveland law enforcement had a, a meeting in, in the community, and they mentioned how um, crack cocaine was mixed with fentanyl, and that it was causing uh, immediate death. Uh, people literally were dying, and that the psychosis was they thought this was a, a great drug. So it, it wasn't that people went away from it. People were attracted to it because they thought it was just stronger than anything they were using before. Uh, my, my question, though, is when you mix cocaine and the fentanyl, how do you record it on this graph? Which, which category does it fall in? They're both going to be tracked, fentanyl and cocaine. Um, and, you know, the total number is the total number. So if it's a mixture of the two, that only gets counted once. But for the individual plots, each time we get a positive screen for either, whether it's mixed or individual, we still count that for this graph. 727 captures everything. That captures everything, and there's no reduplication there. You itemize it, and someone has both crack and fentanyl in their system. Which category does it? They go into both. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the outside of that graph, okay. anytime you add, you know, the red to the green line, oh, it's I more see. than our total number, and that's a reflection frequently of mixtures. Gotcha. Thank and you. I think your point's well taken that that's been a terrible impact in the African-American community. Traditionally, cocaine was a drug that we saw more inner city African-American community. And we rarely saw opioid overdoses in that community until about 2015, 2016. And I think, you know, our office was one of the first to recognize that the mixture of cocaine with fentanyl was driving this big spike in opioid mortality in the African-American community. And the percentage of people dying of cocaine overdoses who were African-American was paradoxically going down because out in you know, our suburban communities uh, and you know, white drug-using communities in the suburbs, we were seeing more cocaine because these were people who traditionally were abusing opioids, but now they were getting cocaine and opioids. Thank you. Anything else? Uh... We are in a bad way with firearms um, and homicide in general. So in 2020, there were 257 homicides in Cuyahoga County, which by any measure I'm able to look at puts us in the top 10 per capita for homicides of all major metropolitan areas in the United States. 2021 is at or ahead of that pace. And the real driver of this is firearms. What we did with this is to go back and look at our data in Cuyahoga County. And I didn't want to put endless graphs on, but I'd like to share a study that we did in our building looking at firearms violence. We went back, we looked at 1990, which is really part of the crack epidemic, which was notorious for firearms violence, 2000, 2010, and 2020. In 1990, there were 221 homicides. It's really the last time we saw over 200 homicides in Cuyahoga County. The majority of these are in the city of Cleveland. I mentioned in 2020, there were 257. In between 2000, there were 100 and in 2010, there were 98 homicides. In 1990, 55% of the homicides were committed with a firearm. That number fluctuated from 53 and 68 in 20, 2000 and 2010. In 2020, 84% of the homicides that were committed in our city, or pardon me, in our county, were committed with a firearm. That's a dramatic increase. The other thing I would say is we wanted to look at what was changing. 
The average number of gunshot wounds per homicide victim in these firearms homicides doubled from 1990 to 2020. And the number of individuals who were shot seven or more times went from single digits, 1990, 2000, 2010, 3, 3, and 5, up to 38 in 2020. So the scope of the violence is it's an increase in firearms, and it's certainly a big increase in the number of shots being fired. I'll talk about that more when I talk about the firearms laboratory. The big population that are suffering from this are African-American young men. We certainly have seen some increase in teenagers, but the primary demographic is about 20 to 40. Police-involved shootings are not a big part of this problem. There were three police-involved shootings in 2017. All three of the perpetrators were armed, and they represent less than 1% of our firearms. Or pardon me, they represent just 1% of our firearms fatalities. I hope to write this research up, and I really would have to give a you know, thank you to council and the executive for funding an epidemiologist in our office who can actually collect this data. Because I think it's going to be really important in how we respond to know what the problem is. Too many guns and too many shots being fired out of those guns. I've heard things about like, oh, this must be COVID. I don't know how. It's not domestic violence. It's not people who are sort of stuck, you know, in closed spaces with each other. It's a demographic we see too much over and over again, young black men killing young black men. I'm pleased to say, you know, we were ahead of the curve again, at least in terms of studying the CDC recently encouraged studying gun violence as a problem. Thanks to Cuyahoga County's efforts in bringing an epidemiologist, a public health person in-house in our building, we're ahead of that curve. I don't have answers, I confess to that. I think, you know, the work of violence interrupters, reducing access to guns through background checks and reducing magazine capacity are things we all should be looking at because that's what data is saying to us. I am not a, an anti-gun guy. But this is just unacceptable stuff. I'd be happy to answer any questions on that before I go to the firearms laboratory. One, uh, one thank you for this information. Uh, we experience it, we see it, we know it, we hear it on the news. But to look at this graph, and also something I've never seen before that your graph shows, you give a historical perspective. Uh, you go back to 1969, you're seeing over 300 deaths a year. I don't know if you have any insight into the pattern, but overall I see a, a drop from the six, 1969. Just the image of the, the roller coaster line, it kind of goes down below the 300 number. What was going on back in the 60s that are... That historically different than now, um, and we certainly have some immediate you know, clarion call of concern right now, but... Homicide clusters in big cities, and it's a reflection of the population. So the population of the city of the Cleveland, 1960s and 1970s, was dramatically higher than it is today. Yet, the homicides, far and away, are still predominantly perpetrated as a total number within the city of Cleveland with a much smaller population, which is why I find this more disturbing. Capita, so to speak. Pardon me? Per capita. Per capita. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the other piece of this is, you know, we're in a club we really don't want to belong to in terms of per capita homicide violence by firearms. You know, and I think you read the same things I do. Oh, what happened in Chicago? What happened in New York? What happened in Los Angeles? What happens in Cleveland, Detroit, Baltimore, and St. Louis eclipse in terms of violence per population, anything going on in those cities. 
So when you see the homicide, um, uh, um, victims of a homicide come through the office, do you have any um, background around the circumstances? Is it drug related? Is it, you know, do you have any sense? You know, I defer to law enforcement on those, but the sense I get, drugs and gang violence. Thank you. And sort of where those two overlap. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Doctor. As far as the, um, you pointed out the um, number of shots per, uh, per, victim. per victim has increased. So is that, is that related to the, an increase in, in homicides? Or is that just... That's a separate measure. So if I take how many times was each homicide victim shot and compare it across those four years that I mentioned, that number is going up. The majority of people who wind up in the medical examiner's office were shot once or twice. But the number of people who are being shot beyond that is significantly rising. So in 2020 about 17% of all the people who were shot, which is 217 people, were shot seven times or more. We use that as a cutoff because that's the traditional magazine for a revolver, six, the six-shooter. And I think what it reflects is when I look at the magazine of a semi-automatic handgun, because most of these are handgun shots, or you know, semi-automatic rifle, these are big magazines, and we see it also in the next uh, bottom part of this, the number of submissions to the firearms laboratory is increasing dramatically too. We do need to do something to interrupt gun violence on a very basic level, just more, less than the shots being fired. So, so let me ask you as a follow-up to that. So when you say submiss submissions to the firearms labs, how, how, does, how does that work? Is that, is that police officers providing you with the gun or is it, how does that work? Well, if there's a call for shots fired, police would respond to scene and pick up shell casings. And that's the primary source of our firearm submissions. If there are bullets, for example, somebody shot, we recover bullets at autopsy, that would also be something that would be submitted to the firearms laboratory. The biggest contributions to the firearms laboratory are going to be the shell casings recovered from scene. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a very complex issue on many on many levels. Yeah, I don't presume you know. to understand it, and I don't want to you know, yeah. come here as a guy who's like guns are evil. I, I don't believe. No, that. I understand. Uh, yeah. They're a sign of deeper problems in a community. Right, but uh, certainly, illegal firearms on the streets probably don't help as well. No, I think yeah. that's very true. And you know, one of the things I think that's kind of been bandied about is this idea of the ghost gun. You sort of have your computer-aided design, you know, and then you put the right materials into the, you know, 3D printer and you come out with a gun. We've had two ghost guns in our laboratory and we've had plenty of conventional firearms in our laboratory. So right. I think, you know, better to not get distracted on what seems glitzy. The fundamental problem is the guns that are already here, you know, winding their way into the hands of people who are using them for illegal purposes. Right. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. That is a disturbing report. Um, you probably may not be able to answer this, but you did mention background check. So are we tracking whether these guns that are confiscated um, are illegal guns or are they not? You know, Councilwoman Baker, I'd have to defer to law enforcement on that. I think what we can do in a firearms laboratory is take a serial number, even if it's been, you know, attempt to kind of alter it. We can get that, and that should be a means to track where these guns are coming from. I think one of the things that we have seen are kind of this idea of the community gun that somehow gets passed from multiple people and is used in multiple crimes. Uh, they're illegal guns, obviously. Right. Just, you know, in, in drilling down, I, a background check, of course, is I support it. I just don't know how that would impact what we're talking about when we have illegal guns, perhaps the majority of guns that are out there that would never go through a, a background check and are passed around, as you just explained. Uh, that's probably more for our 
law enforcement to answer. Um, also, maybe for them and not you, would be gang related, territorial. Do we have issues out there, social issues that need to be addressed more so than perhaps the last act of, of uh, firearms? Any of that been part of your studies? It hasn't. I mean, this was something I just wanted to kind of get some basic data on. I can tell you one of the things that uh, our agency participates in is a child fatality review, where unfortunately we've seen, you know, way too many teenagers being shot. And inevitably, as we look at those instances of firearms, you know, violence with tragic endings, these aren't people who just materialize, mysteriously materialize out of nowhere. They've been in the system. We've had opportunities to change things there. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't, you know, presume to know exactly how to change them, but I always think the same thing applies to drugs. When we have problems hiding in plain sight, they're a lot easier to identify than the ones that we really have to dig deep into. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. So, uh, are there any programs being done to try and combat this gun violence either in your office or elsewhere in, in the county that you're aware of? I know there's a, you know, project in our community that we've kind of cooperated with, uh, which is a violence interrupting uh, group. Individually in my office, uh, I don't have specific programs to address firearms violence. I think the contribution that we make to gun firearms violence is running a good firearms laboratory. And that's kind of the next thing I was going to talk about. But, you know, I think it's kind of one of these things like we talked about at the beginning of the opioid crisis. I don't think a robust law enforcement response is in any way counterindicated. I just don't know that we get the opportunity to arrest our way out of this problem. One, uh, I like the graph you've shown. I like it in the context of it's insightful and Edu uh, informative. Uh, I think you could like if you would add that per capita graph as well to show how the whole population is coming down, how that um, increased in comparison. Obviously, a smaller population. I couldn't do this, but the epidemiologist can. Epidemiologist. <laughs> no, and I think it's a good idea because. It's one thing, you know, to look at this and say, well, it was worse in the 70s, but the truth is per capita in the city of Cleveland, it's worse in 2020. Those two graphs together, I think, help further emphasize the, the point that's well made even, even in this. It's, it's very clear uh, that there is a, um, a serious problem, and I think we've all known it, but I think what you brought to the table is just the hard data that someone can look at and see this number how serious the problem is. Um, I, I totally agree with you. We're not going to arrest our way out of, out of this. Uh, it's going to require more community-based activities. Uh, and, and there are uh, groups in the community who I've talked with that, that uh, feel they can make an impact. And, and it is about uh, making contact, as you say, interrupting, uh, uh, engaging this community, and have success at, at uh, making a change. And I've seen people make um, make an impact. The ability to scale it up, I think, is, is what's needed. Uh, so I continue to look to work with the faith community. Um, we've seen safe surrenders where uh, institutions or churches have uh, had uh, a buyback or take back of guns, a safe surrender um, program. It happened probably eight years ago. Uh, maybe at a point where, just as a small part of the solution, where we find a way to make that sustainable. We can work with judges and who, who will coordinate this and say, how can you do this, not just once, um, but work that it's a regular occurrence. Uh, so all these things find a way to, 
to uh, strengthen and, and su make sustainable all of the activities that clearly can make that per capita number go down because we've seen it be impacted. We've just never put a sustained effort towards it. And so, so those are the things. I I'll even say our, our closing the achievement gap initiative in the schools has an impact. It, everything is just one small part of the overall solution. But engaging our youth at ninth grade, um, I, I've buried, I've seen the list, you know, you, I've, I've asked you for and you've, you've given me the list of, of just those individuals who, are, who make up these 200 numbers. I've seen those names and, and I've had a part in burying some of those individuals. Sure. I recognize the names um, and, and again, I, I, I've just looked at them and I've, and I've seen, and this is anecdotal, but individuals never finish high school. You know, they get to the ninth grade, they drop out 10th, 11th. They never finish, never graduate. And whether they, they pass at a younger age in their 20s or 30s, it's still n never finishing high school is a significant part of, of, of this population. So programs like closing the achievement gap that the county has that really allows an individual to avoid destructive activity and, and stay on the track to, to productive activity, constructive opportunity. So, and it's not one thing, but it's just seeing it organically and holistically and saying we want to make a sustainable effort, not just to rest try to rest our way out, but look at those societal changes, as Councilwoman Baker mentioned, um, that, are, are, that are playing a, a role in this and start to impact them. And I believe it's something we can bring that number down, but it's important to see it. Like any checkup at the doctor, you need to know what the numbers are. No, it's it's a crude metric. I mean, you know, thankfully everybody who gets shot doesn't die, but it's a metric that we need to see change. The individual end up in some time in wheelchairs and right. You know, yeah, I mean that's as bad an outcome, if not worse. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, where will we go to get the statistics on the guns themselves that are legal and illegal? Um. My guess would be that the majority of the guns that are probably the city of Cleveland Police Department. They, I they, mean, most of you never of the, hear that stat, and I always wonder why. You don't know. I mean, uh, the leads get generated from the firearms laboratory back to the investigating agency, yeah. and I would say, you know, parenthetically on some of this too. Part of the big surge in violence has not just been confined to the city of Cleveland, but East Cleveland, and I, I just call them the Heights, Garfield Heights, Warrensville Heights, Cleveland Heights, uh, Maple Heights. Those inner ring suburbs on the east side have also seen a disproportionate increase mm -hmm. in the number of firearms homicides there as well. I, when, I, when I buy my guns, they do a background check. And if you haven't bought a gun and gone through a background check, um, it's like getting patted down seriously at the airport. Uh, you're not walking out of there. I was there when a guy was trying to get a gun, and they turned him down. He wasn't happy, but he didn't walk out with a gun. But if he walked out on the street and connected with somebody that had an illegal gun or a stolen gun, then we, we got the problem. I, I don't know how to fix that. No, and I think some of it, you know, people talk about, you know, what happens at gun shows because right. I think there's still the opportunity to do background checks there, but it's not compulsory to do background checks at gun shows. It, that, that's, that's definitely an issue, and private gun sellers are, is definitely an issue. Right. But there has to, I mean, they have to keep a record of the sale, and if that gun is tracked to a crime then in some way you should be held responsible because you're being irresponsible by not checking out who you're selling a gun to. I know there's a dog chasing the tail, but it just seems pretty reasonable to me that whoever sells the gun is responsible for that. Has that some degree gun. of responsibility. No, I, I agree. I don't know why we can't get over that hump, but I find that those that don't have anything to hide don't hide things. And uh, <laughs> Well said. Well, I, I don't know. Um, and... Uh, during COVID, have our suicides, in, in particularly with youth, gone up? I haven't looked at youth in particular. Across the board? Over, across the board, no. no. 
you know, and uh, I don't know, you know, that's not a national trend from what I can glean. The other thing that we really kind of bucked the national trend on was drug overdoses, which since the lockdown orders went into place have gone up nationally, but our drug overdose numbers in 2020 at least remained relatively stable. I would like to think that that reflects a lot of the work we've been doing up until now with the drug crisis. But um, no, those two did not pan out sort of the way they did across the country. Yeah, and, and with the opioid problems that we've had, I was just watching a uh, movie about the New York Mets and Doc Gooden and Daryl Strawberry and Len Bias, who was drafted by the Boston Celtics and died two days later of a drug overdose of cocaine, who knows what was in it, you'd think that would send shockwaves throughout the community, especially in, in people that are, that are athletes whose bodies are finely tuned. And Daryl Strawberry was talking about how he was insisting on how his drug guy find out what bias got. He wanted to get biased. Yeah, that's a funny thing. I mean, that's sort of paradoxical attraction to they the good get, stuff. They want to get near death. And it it's it's I don't know that I don't know how you combat. I don't know how I don't know how you win that war. It just seems attrition and I just don't know where you go from there. So we're we're if you have any ideas. But People, I was at a funeral two two weeks ago of a 24 year old girl, opioid death. And her sister OD'd at the wake. So I mean, it's just it's heartbreaking. No, I've had more than my share of conversations with parents. Uh, I, we barely see it. You see it a lot. I know Mr. Jones sees it a lot. So it's uh, Ms. Simon, sir. Ms. Simon, do you have anything? Good afternoon. Okay, Doc. Um, one of the things, though, that's going to be critical to combating gun violence is our firearms laboratory, and I wanted to give an update on that. Um, you can see from the box there that we're already past our submissions in 2021 where we, for everything we received in 2020, which was a dramatic uh, you know, high number compared to previous years. Um, we recently were granted access to the Correlation Center through the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Department. I think there's going to be things that are going to kind of game change here. When a firearm is, when an auto, a semi automatic firearm is fired, it kicks out a casing. And when the hammer of the gun strikes the casing, it leaves a distinctive mark on the back of it, which is kind of how the gunpowder ignites, the primer ignites, the gunpowder ignites. There's a thing called the NIBIN system, the National Integrated Ballistic Identification Network, that collects those images and matches images from one crime to another crime. We were really struggling to keep up with things because this big influx in gun crime was overburdening our laboratory. So there are th really three stages in firearms examination skill. One is photographing in a standardized way that mark that the hammer of the gun leaves on the cartridge. That's called data acquisition. We had three people dedicated to doing that. Once it's fed into the Nibin big computer for a match, that's called correlation. Or pardon me, that's just called match. You get a list of potential matches. A person has to pull those casings and do comparisons at that point or pull those images and do comparisons. That's called correlation. Well, the three people in our office who were doing the acquisition, we trained up to do correlation because we were falling behind in it. But really it was kind of a steel peter to pay Paul because when they're doing correlations, they're not doing acquisitions, we fall behind on data entry. So one of the proposals that we're going to work through, and it should be coming soon to you, is to hire additional people to do acquisition, to get those images and enter them into the NIBIN system. 
ATF helped us out considerably when they put us on the correlation center because now through their headquarters for NIBE and comparisons down in Atlanta, they'll do all that matching for us. Why do we still need the new people then? Legitimate question. Because the real cream of the crop for firearms examination is firearms examination. These are the things where you take bullets and try to match them to guns. You can teach somebody to do acquisition in a matter of weeks. You can teach them to do correlation in a matter of months. It takes a solid two years to produce a firearms examiner, and there is a distinct shortage of firearms examiners in the United States. So we are not going to be recruiting people to Cleveland unless we really you know, double our salaries or something. We have to develop our in-house talent. So the folks who were doing the acquisition we trained to do correlation are now going to start to train to be firearms examiners. I think that this is a good long-term approach to doing good firearms, res not research, work, so that we can actually meet this glut of material, unfortunately, that's coming out of all the gun violence. In the meantime, short term, we have to, just to keep up with demands of the legal system, bring people on to assist my three firearms examiners doing firearms examination. So I didn't want to do a short-term fix without having a long-term fix in, in mind, which is develop the talent we have in-house to do those comparisons. That's the next phase. Happy to answer any questions there. I'm sorry, I know the sheriff has. I think I'd calculate into uh, that plan, a plan on keeping those people, because as we're going to find out next, we train people in the jail or as deputies, and they go where the money is. You know, and that's kind of what happened with one of our folks who we trained up, uh, that, you know, we sent her down to Quantico to get trained, and... You know, as soon as she could, she was going to leave. And I told her, no, you, you owe us two years for the time we sent to train you. I think going forward, if we commit the same amount of time to these folks, you're know, going to require them to, you know, stay around for, you know, longer than two years for sure. But if you go out to the uh, firearm and tool mark examiners, their professional organization's website, there are literally dozens of jobs unfilled and they're offering higher salaries than we're paying in our laboratory. Questions for the doctor? Mr. Miller. The primary purpose for matching uh, bullets to guns, is, is that primarily to solve crimes? Yes. The reason it's helpful to match the casings to other casings is to link crimes. Because if I have casings from a homicide case, I put them into a knife and I may get casings to an assault case where the person survived and can say, this is the person who shot at me. They generate tremendously good leads. It's taking advantage, I think, of what computers can do in 2021 to crime solve. Okay, thank you. Anything further? Doctor, thank you uh, for some sobering information. And once again, anything that you need, we are at your service. I wasn't finished, but I know the sheriff's here. <laughs> oh, did you want to go? <laughs> oh, man. That's all right. He's not on overtime yet. Oh, geez. It's, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick on some things. Uh, I'm sorry to go late. Uh, oh, I your next page. Oh, I didn't see COVID. COVID. Here, here it is. Um, another graph. This is just tracking the number of deaths that were reported to our office. Again, a, you know, a great thank you for the epidemiologist, kind of the public health person embedded in our office. We were able to demonstrate, and we're going to present this at a national meeting, the number of cases that get reported to our office is a good mirror for the number of people who are being hospitalized and dying of COVID. 
So we use that number knowing what our baseline was when it started to rise up to ask the state to send us refrigerated trucks. One of the reasons I wanted to follow that number is because the people who die or are hospitalized of COVID, especially the ones who die of COVID, don't wind up in the medical examiner system. They're already in the healthcare system. They have a doctor who can certify their death. It's the people who get sick outside of the healthcare system who are the ones who will wind up in our jurisdiction. Most of the time, though, the folks who have COVID and are going to die from it get sick and make it to the hospital. But there is a significant percentage of people who get sick with COVID, tend to be younger people, people of color, and they don't access the healthcare system for a variety of reasons. So what we just found looking sort of to see if we were missing that population is the number of people who get reported to our office on any given day, which is very measurable, is a good reflection of the number of the people in the community who have COVID and ultimately with a couple week lag who are gonna die of COVID. So for mass fatality planning, it was an unexpected benefit to just start looking at that question. And I honestly think looking at this graph and where we're trending, we're probably gonna have another spike. I mean, we're already on an upswing. I don't know if it'll be as bad as we saw last winter and fall, but we're trending in an upward direction. So I took my mask off, you have yours off, some of them, but anyway, uh, all the things that are important, you know, are still important. Um, I think the silver lining of this is that without vaccines in 1918, the pandemic went away in about two years. So we're in our second year. That's what I'm hoping for. And the last one I wanted to mention, this is actually about our workload. Um, we've had a steady increase in the number of cases coming to our office, specifically autopsy cases. I mentioned the shortage of forensic firearms professionals. There's also a shortage of forensic pathologists. The number of forensic pathologists, the science, the medical professionals in my office hasn't changed in the last 15 years. And in between, we've had an opioid crisis and now a spike in violent crime. I am trying to address some of this with our coroner's association because we're in a situation now that isn't really sustainable with our current staff. And we've ignored a problem for too long that we can't just kind of grab people out of a stream of, you know, this reservoir of forensic pathologists. Those people just don't exist. In our office, all but one of the physicians is over the age of 50. They're going to retire. We're, we're going to retire. And there's really not a lot of training coming up to replace those, those of us who will retire. Doctor, what's CA and OU mean? CA, IN just means in county, we accepted jurisdiction and brought the uh, decedent to our office. Of that, we'll make a decision once they're there, do they need an autopsy? So that's the next line. CA is a, it's, it's short for coroner's amendment. It's just a term left over that we used. I had the feeling we were transporting too many people to our office who could have easily been certified and gone direct to a funeral home. So what we would do is say you had somebody who was 80 years old who fell and broke their hip two weeks before they never made it out of the hospital and they eventually succumbed to complications of that injury. That person really doesn't need to come to the medical examiner's office to have somebody take a 10-minute look at them, have my transporter charges $225, $225 to bring them there. So myself and the chief deputy medical examiner review records on those cases, give those folks a death certificate. They're still our jurisdiction because they're injured, but we save ourselves transportation costs, and I think we offer a convenience to the family that we turn around the death certificates on these folks a lot faster so they can start with insurance and things like that. I can tell you when I came here, we were doing about 100 CA cases a year. Originally, I took on all of them. Then as we came up to 500, that's when I signed up my chief deputy to help me out with them. So we're trying to minimize the impact on the staff of how many bodies they have to look at. 
OU refers to out of county autopsies. The first year I was here, we did just under 200. This year, we're projecting to do somewhere close to 600. That's the part I need to take up with the State Coroner's Association is that's not sustainable for me without additional staff. And I don't know that, you know, I look at these as money-making things uh, so much as I look at them now as do I have the staff and can I get the staff even to do them? And that's a very big question that I don't think is answerable, but the answer to that may be no. Question is, Mr. Jones. What is causing the spike of out-of-county? You know, I think in no small measure they're seeing at a lesser, you know, per capita rate the number of homicides rising too. So if I think about how many of these 500 or 550 to 600 cases are homicides, it's going to be over 100. And the big places where I'm seeing them from are Youngstown, Mahoning County, Canton and Stark County, and then a smattering of other counties as well. But urban that number's certainly up. Hmm? Urban communities in those areas. Urban communities in those areas too. Yeah, we're not unique in our, I think it's just because of the bigger concentration of people in the city of Cleveland, we have a higher number, but they're certainly seeing their own spike too. Youngstown has their own medical examiner. Why would they? He died. Dr. Orr, his name is Dr. Joe Orr, he died of pancreatic cancer, and they've not been able to recruit anybody to replace him. And that was five years ago. And I think, you know, Does they, lack the they don't have the person there and the salary that they're offering, you know, which I think is as good as they can offer, isn't competitive because of the shortage You mentioned earlier um, the term CA. What does that CA stand for again? Case amendment or coroner amendment. It was originally coroner, but every now and again they, they, you they acknowledge that we're a medical examiner's office in my office. You characterize that as cases that you would actually sign the death certificate for. We have to by statute, yeah. But you don't bring them to the examiner's office. You allow That's right. We certify them on a medical record review. I haven't seen how that situation plays out. When, you, when you're at the home, let's say you're at the home, you, you either have a doctor who agrees to sign or you come take the I, I've never been at the home where you say, we're going to sign, but you know, home take the, the bond. These probably aren't going to be people who come from their own home. They're often going to be people in a nursing home who maybe they got to the hospital you know, they had their hip repaired, but they never rallied. They went to a long-term care facility, and they died there. Or they may die in the hospital, and we'll just okay. tell the hospital, look, don't have your doctor sign the death certificate. This is medical examiner's jurisdiction, and uh, you can still release the person to funeral home. The fact that you haven't heard about them tells me that system's working pretty well then. <laughs> That's good. I, I was thinking about the challenge at home when the home ones, the, yeah, wouldn't work out so well. Two in the morning and you try to call the doctor, but you don't reach him. Then at that time, the coroner, you either decide you're going to take take responsibility. Boy, the only one I can really think of where we, uh, you know, signed somebody from home was a person who died visiting family. They had a doctor, but they were from out of state. And they were really sick. That's the only time, you know, and I've been doing these now for over five years. Uh, that's the only time I remember releasing anybody direct from home to a funeral home because we were able to touch base with the doctor. And he said, you know, I'd signed a death certificate, but I'm not licensed in Ohio. So it just made more sense, you know, to have that person released because they were going back out of state anyway. And it might be routine. Someone, by routine, you know, I mean, someone senior was passed under the doctor's care. Maybe at 2 in the morning, the doctor doesn't answer the phone or you can't reach them. So at that moment, you release them to the funeral home. But then the doctor can turn around and say, I'm not going to We've sign. talked about this. No, we've talked about <laughs> it. So yeah, the world needs to know. <laughs> so when they release the body to us, and then the doctor says to me, 
oh, I haven't seen that person. I'm not going to sign. Now, if I have the person, then I'm not a doctor, so I have to accept that he's not going to sign. But you as a, a you may look at it and feel differently that you, he should sign. Yeah, and I mean, we've been in touch with the state uh, medical board, the Department of Health, as to what's reasonable for expectations in those. And I, you know, as we've talked about, I don't want to leave the funeral homes hanging on these, but, you know, I think there's a point where you have to kind of call the vote on the doctor and say, listen, it is reasonable for you to sign here. And, you know, not everybody who dies at home needs to come to the coroner's office and, you know, do your job, doc. That's the way I feel. I'm caught in the middle. I accept what the doctor says when he says I can't sign. And then I call you and you say he should sign. So at that moment, I've got no word that he says he should sign. Then what you're saying is I should just call the medical. Call the As I've always tried to say to, you know, my partners in the funeral homes, uh, if I sign the death certificate, I want you to file a complaint with the medical board because that person should have signed. Okay. We didn't, you know, create criteria that I think were unreasonable. You know, if you're taking insurance money to take care of somebody and then they die and it's inconvenient because it's two in the two o'clock at night, that doesn't mean that becomes a public problem for your medical examiner or coroner's office. You still have a responsibility there. That's my feeling. Okay. But no, I don't want to see you all caught in the funeral director's caught in the middle of that. All right. That's what happens at two in the morning. We get caught in the middle. You get caught at eight in the morning. When they refuse to, when they call you back eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. That seemed to be a little inside baseball, but uh, but we learned I from knew it what was. we learned from that. We don't want to see Mr. Jones pulling into your driveway at two a.m. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeremy, I just ask, and I know we're short on time, but I this is an opportunity. Maybe you can or can't ask it. Under the COVID nineteen deaths that you have printed here, that say that we're back to levels in January, February, twenty twenty one. Before the vaccine was really readily available, it was just starting to roll out. And then you also say trending upward prior to and after November, December 2020 peak. How do you explain, I guess, and many people ask, we're almost 60% vaccinated in Cuyahoga County. So that leaves approximately 40% there that are not. And the most vulnerable, which we thought at the beginning is who needed it most, are vaccinated. How is it that we are in this upward trend with such a high vaccination and slowly but growing um, and still look at the deaths being reported as continuing to increase? You know, I think things, there's a lot in play with COVID. So most of the people who die now of COVID are unvaccinated. And while 60% looks like a good number. You know, I still have people in our office wearing masks at a 95% vaccination rate. We are not close to what's called herd immunity, which means it would be difficult to transmit the disease in the population, even among unvaccinated people, because there's so much, you know, built in either immunity from having the disease or being vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's part of the factor you know, the other piece of it is as these variants show up, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, my head spins when I, I think about coronavirus things too. Um, as the variants show up, like the Delta variant and these things, they may or may not be as susceptible to the immunity, I should say, of the individual may or may not be as good as it was for the original, you know, COVID-19 virus Uh and I would think, you know, the last thing is, and that's the black boxes, does immunity wane over time to the point that you can be reinfected? And that's going to be especially important, I think, in the people who were vaccinated on the first round, not so much the healthcare workers, but the populations who were at risk. So our elders and seniors and folks who, you know, were first in line because they should have been because they're, you know, more vulnerable. If their immunity wanes, yeah, then we're in for a lot harder go of things. So that's my two cents on it. But uh, I confess I don't understand everything COVID and 
Uh, I guess logic, I, and maybe logic doesn't work here, that if you have 60% vaccinated, and even if there's breakthrough, the case is generally mild, um, why we would think we would be on an upward trend, or if we are, how, how are we, given that the most vulnerable are taken care of, the younger people that tend to be stronger and have more immunity overall, um, doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense, but I do. No, and I think sometimes we look at apples and oranges, too. Is it fair to look at infections versus hospital admissions and deaths? You know, because the last month, week I looked at, you know, there were 200 deaths from COVID in the state of Ohio, which, you know, that's bad for those 200 people. But if I take, you know, our usual my back of the envelope calculation, a tenth of the population of Ohio lives in Cuyahoga County. Well, that's 20 deaths in Cuyahoga County, which isn't good for those 20 folks again. But, you know, Mr. Jones and all of the funeral homes that we have in Cuyahoga County aren't going to be overwhelmed with that number of deaths. But it's kind of the warning call. Am I on this part of the curve or am I on this part of the curve? And that was kind of what I think we were able to do with our partners at the Board of Health was to kind of tell them, you know, look, we're starting to see more cases reported to our office. We should get ready. We should reach out to the funeral homes and see if they're feeling overwhelmed. Reach out to the hospitals to see if their, you know, capacity is being overwhelmed because that's going to be a different phase in a mass casualty response. And it was just kind of you know, one of these fortuitous things, like we just wanted to make sure we weren't missing people and we found a nice metric to start our disaster planning. When do we need refrigerated trucks and things like that? Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll say this last year, we had 60 cases, uh, COVID cases last year that, that we served families. Um, you know, before my father was one of them, my father passed of COVID back on that and he was in a nursing home and sometimes I kick myself now and I think you know I've, I've worn masks from January 1 of 1992 is when I joined the family business and I remember going into the embalming room and the first time I put on the equipment and put on a, a mask and from 92 to the day I never thought you know it was a, that the mask was going to fail me I was uh, we, I, I've seen AIDS cases West Nile virus, all you name all of them, prion and a, a men you haven't even heard of. But every time I was always comfortable that my equipment was protecting me. So the idea that now masks are a, a problem, it shouldn't be like that, even though it is. No, please stop. <laughs> right. So it should be a commercial. We're not spreading that word. I'm sorry. You should, you should do a commercial. And we've seen doctors on TV for years in surgery and wearing a mask, protecting themselves and the the patient that they may be, be working on. Um, there's no reason for a mask not to be to be in this situation that it's in the mask finds itself in today. Um, and um, you know, like I said, I I, I I look back and I'll just share with you personally. I look back and say, why well, did not think that the nursing home would let me in to see my father in those days? And um, but I always knew, and I've, I even said in this committee, in this uh, at, in these council chambers at times. I said, we're taking temperatures, but people are asymptomatic. I was going into hospitals, taking my temperature, I was, but I didn't know if I was asymptomatic or not. So we gave the asymptomatic people a free run of hospitals and nursing homes, kept the families out, um, but Kobe went into the nursing homes and it was never stopped. And it wasn't the family and it wasn't the residents leaving. It was employees who came in, gave it to someone who gave it to someone else, who gave it to another employee who took it and left out with it. Um, but that's what was happening. And I just said, why don't I just take a box of these old things and tell them, you put this on my father and you don't take it off. And, you know, and so it never, it never occurred. Don't know why, but it didn't. But we should be wearing these masks until you figure this whole thing out. And so people who decide to get vaccinated or not, protect yourself like I protect myself in the embalming room. Like you protect yourself in the coroner's office. Sure. You know, I should be a commercial saying that. They, 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 they work before and they work today. And we should expect doctors to continue to wear them in surgery and everywhere else. And uh, get past all the politics around these things. So, 
That's my commercial. Right. That's it. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I, I recommend a PSA from Dr. Gilson and President Jones to our communication department. We're going to talk about the uh, jail, but I'd like, Chair, if I, if I may, uh, Dr. Bruner, if I could have you first, uh, and then the sheriff. Welcome. We just wanted to touch base with you, see how things are going over yeah. there, see how we're dealing with COVID or how you're dealing with it. And if you see any things that you need us to act on, let okay. us know. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, meet with you all today. I appreciate it. Uh, I, th I think you likely remember that in March in 2020 that um, the county... Uh, that included um, all factions really worked together to help set the stage for us to be able to manage COVID uh, in the jail. And um, that was truly a valuable opportunity for us to be able to isolate and quarantine and really manage the cases as they, as they occurred in that space. Uh, and uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about death um, re relative to COVID uh, over the last hour. And um, to date, there has not been an inmate that's died as a complication relative to COVID. Um, I'm a little hesitant to say those words in general, um, but I think it is something that should be noted. Uh, at this time. Um, since then, uh, the population has been steadily increasing uh, since last April of 2020. And uh, the team, uh, the medical team, the jail team, all of us have worked uh, really to manage those logistical challenges uh, in the light of the population size. And along with that, we've gained a lot of understanding around how the, the virus uh, works and how, who's gr at greatest risk. And uh, so one of the things that we've done over the last month is create a phase three plan in relation to managing COVID within the jail. Uh, the primary focus of that is really uh, honing in on the needs of the folks that are medically at risk uh, and monitoring them very closely. Um, the vaccine program is also uh, part of that as well, really um, emphasizing the value of getting vaccinated, um, especially when you're living in a congregate living space such as the jail. Uh, reinforcing the use of facial masks. I mean, we were just having this conversation, right? So the value of, of facial masks and the value of social distancing uh, and continuing the surveillance in relation to uh, as people are entering the jail and testing people when they're symptomatic. So all of those things are still in construct, but as I said, the primary focus that we're looking at right now is the uh, medical care of those who are at greatest risk for complications relative to the illness. So um, with that, we do have access to a daily list of people who are considered medically high risk. Um, I am able to um, uh, filter that for the ones that have been recently diagnosed. The team has that list. They use that on a daily basis to ensure that those individuals are being watched very closely. Uh, we can also look at that list in relation to the number of people on that list that have been vaccinated or have been partially vaccinated, we can do a variety of different things relative to that. Um, for those that are not high risk uh, and do develop COVID, they are monitored as well. But they um, typically the course is, is simpler for them and is an easier course and they're less likely to require hospitalization or, or uh, additional treatments. Um, the vaccine program has been going, ongoing since April of 2021, and over the summer, the team has been coming in weekly to provide vaccines from the, from the public health department at Metro. Uh, and the jail administration has received approval from the Board of Control to provide some financial incentives to inmates so that they will uh, be more um, willing to do the vaccine. And uh, we have continued to support the use of facial masks. And for those that are asymptomatic, um, 
uh, that are housed in a scenario where they're in isolation. If they need to attend a court proceeding, we've had conversations with the courts around the safety and the value of that mask in relation to those scenarios. Um, the testing strategy largely is focused on, on the admission process and surveillance in that space in the seven-day housing area that was implemented back in March of 2020. And we continue to monitor and uh, provide testing for those that are symptomatic and isolate when there is a symptomatic case for the people living in that housing unit uh, and monitor them closely for any signs of symptoms during that 14-day period of time. So, uh, Councilman, you asked about the current numbers in relation to, to COVID in the jail. So, as of today, uh, there are 22 people with active COVID cases, five of which are known to be medically high risk. Uh, in the last month, we've had two individuals hospitalized. Um, one is still currently in the hospital. The other one was discharged from the hospital. Um, our vaccination rates to date, 698 people have been vaccinated at the jail. There are um, 381 that are currently still in jail. Um, and there's an additional 100 people in jail right now that have received one dose only of a vaccine. So that gives us 20% of the jail population is fully immunized. Another 5% is partially immunized. And that means 75% of the jail is not. Um, when you look at the medically high risk group, um, 134 individuals in that group are uh, fully vaccinated out of the 515 that are considered medically high risk living in the jail now. So I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Do you have the opportunity to ask those that are high risk that uh, why they wouldn't get vaccinated or you don't even get into that? So uh, the, the staff does ask that question. They offer it. Um, everyone has a different reason often for why they don't want to be vaccinated. It can range from I don't trust the vaccine to, um, to the fact that they believe since they've had COVID that they don't require needing the vaccine. It can be a variety of different reasons. They may have heard of a family member that had a side effect. They're worried about the impact of the vaccine on them. It's a variety of different things. Just wondering. Mm -hmm. Questions for the doctor? Mr. Tuma. Uh, thank you for being here th uh, this afternoon. Um, as far as the um, active COVID cases, what was the high number during the pandemic over the last year and a half? Um, the high number, uh, I believe we were uh, around 200 active cases in December, if I remember correctly. Um, the highest number that we've seen since August has been 59. Okay. And then, um, what, if I could, what's, what's the conversation that is had with um, people that are brought in as far as um, getting the vaccine? Is it, is it as general as you just kind of indicated? Do you want the vaccine? If not, why not? Or... Here's, here's what's the benefits or, you know, is there, is there like an education process that happens or is it just kind of like, do you want it? No. Okay. Thanks. So the, no. So the, the clinical team has provided educational materials to inmates in relation to the opportunity to have a vaccine and the value of it. Um, it's, uh, and the, the nursing staff, when they're on the, on the units providing meds, will will have conversations with people related to having the vaccine as well. Um, and that's often where we'll get some of the referrals is after the med pass, um, uh, there will be a recognized desire to have a vaccine and, and that will facilitate the conversation. Okay, and then what was the percentage again of uh, one-time dosage? Oh, we have 100 people with, um, with a one-time dose. So that's about 5% of the population. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Appreciate it, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Uh, just quickly to understand, um, did you say that, what was the percentage of non-vaccinated overall? 75%. So 75% of those that are in our jails are not vaccinated? Correct. Wow. And uh, how are the incentives that were approved through Board of Control working? So I will leave that answer to the sheriff and the jail administrator to describe the incentive program. And one last question, the asymptomatic, um, are you not as concerned about them because they don't tend to spread 
like a symptomatic person? Why is it that we're not concerned about the asymptomatic? So the, uh, so the asymptomatic cases are being held in exposure isolation for 14 days. So they're following the same protocol we would be using uh, in relation to after a contact exposure. So they're, they're required to remain in that area for that period of time. So it's not, we are concerned about their transmission rates, um, uh, but their symptomatology is not present. So we, it's not being monitored. Last, are we um, testing periodically, not just when they come in and seven days pass, but are we periodically testing inmates that are there? Yes. So um, as a part of the transfer process uh, to other um, uh, facilities, uh, testing is done in that group as well. And again, anyone who is symptomatic is receiving tests. Asymptomatic person who has gone through the seven days. Does so not, at yeah. so at the end of seven days, their first seven days that they're at the jail, they all receive tests before they move for, further into the general population. So everyone receives a surveillance test as they're entering mm -hmm. on that seventh day, um, and then we do random surveillance testing with the people that are leaving. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Pruner, when uh, COVID first hit in the early part of last year, there was a concerted, disciplined, and highly successful effort to bring down the jail population substantially and, and therefore provide some benefits in terms of management capability. Uh, but... Uh, but that level of effort seems to have waned. And, and my question is, uh, is whether the higher jail population is, is creating some additional difficulties in managing COVID-19 in the jail population, and would there be benefits in, in returning to a higher level of discipline on population? So... Um, there's a portion of that question that I feel capable of answering and another portion that I think um, the sheriff can probably speak to more. Um, uh, the more people that are in a small space or a confined space, the, the harder it is to manage. Um, and the ability to separate and distribute people reduces the likelihood of transmission, for sure. Um, I do know that... Um, that the jail and the sheriff's office and the justice center as a whole has uh, has been making concerted efforts to look at, at what they can do to facilitate. Um, but I'd ask that that part of the question uh, be responded to by the sheriff or, or another person. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'll, I'll hold my question. Councilman Mill actually asked me. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to pass the share. So, Doctor, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it for the update. And Sheriff Island, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, to the chair, members of the committee, and other members of council, thank you for the opportunity today to present to you again an update regarding the operations of the Sheriff's Department this time specifically Cuyahoga County Correction Center. Um, I have divided this up into a couple of different small summary categories of topics that I'd like to address, and then I'd be more than happy to answer questions at the end. Uh, these updates are items that have occurred either since my tenure began in March or since the beginning of the year. First item I'd like to touch on is our equipment and facilities upgrades. There's a number of projects that have been completed or are currently under completion in the jail. Uh, and this is primarily facilitated through the Department of Public Works. And it's only a snapshot of the largest projects that we're doing, and it doesn't include the many small projects we do on a daily basis. Uh, first, we have a project in Jail 1, Pod 10B. It's a repair and hardening project. This is a pod that houses some of our most serious offenders and some of those who are actively trying to do the most damage to the facility. And working with Public Works, we've had plumbing shutoffs installed to prevent flooding. Uh, we've hardened our lighting fixtures and our cell door repairs and hardening have been scheduled, and I believe that that project was summed up this week. 
Uh, as you know, since the beginning of COVID, uh, HVAC upgrades were done throughout the Justice Center, specifically also in the jail. Numerous changes were made to the HVA systems, uh, not only to combat COVID, but also to come into compliance with current Ohio jail standards. All of these upgrades have been completed and tested, and the testing results have been forwarded to the Bureau of Adult Detention for review. We have a kitchen renovation project underway. Uh, we have new dishwashing equipment expected to ship soon. Uh, this has required us to build an internal temporary security wall to wall off a portion of the kitchen so that we can begin demolition, create a temporary loading port, and remove all old equipment to prepare for new installation. Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction Inspectors have been on site approving each step. Uh, our biggest project at this point is the Central Booking Construction Project. Central Booking Project required that all of our current commissary and our intake operations are going to be temporarily relocated in the jail to two, in two separate phases. Demolition has already begun. The Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections on-site inspecting has uh, taken place and we expect that this process will take at least until the end of the fourth quarter. We have a project involving jail camera upgrades. Public Works has completed running all new fiber cables, and the project has now moved into an IT installation phase as we wait for installation of equipment into data closets and equipment racks. Our uh, Jail 2 has a door control project. Uh, Public Works has sought appropriations which have been approved for two different vendors, and they will be sending this through the procurement process. Our sixth floor attorney client visitation area is being upgraded. Uh, work has been permitted and approved and a uh, schedule with Public Works has been set with bricklayers to begin that project shortly. Uh, we have elevator issues in our jail too. This has been noted by the inspectors from the city of Cleveland. Project has been mandated by the inspection process. Bids have been received by Public Works and a contract award is moving through the procurement process as we speak. This project also is under the eyes of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction. In sum, Public Works has completed well over 5,300 work orders for improvements and repairs in the jail this year and has just over 600 work orders still outstanding. I'll take a second to uh, thank Mr. Dauber and Mr. Reimer for all the hard work that they and their staffs have put into in improving the conditions and rapidly responding for repairs in a difficult and archaic environment. Another topic I'd like to talk to you about very quickly is our training. As you may know, training in a 24-7, 365 environment is very difficult because every hour that is spent training an employee usually requires backfill of that employee to make sure that important jobs are still being completed. That and a shortage of staffing has had an impact on our training. But despite all the difficulties and hardships of our staffing, just during the last six months, the Correction Center was able to provide over 3,100 hours of advanced and in-service training to employees, including, but not limited to, 40-hour crisis intervention certification courses for 35 officers, full-day verbal de-escalation courses for 43 officers, full-day subject control courses for 33 officers, and many partial-day in-service classes to numerous other employees on many topics, including legal aspects of corrections, handcuffing, fire safety and evacuation, cell extraction, interpersonal communications, and basic jail safety. Uh, one of the things that I uh, wanted to thank Dr. Bruner for again, and to let you guys know about, is they are, we are working very uh, diligently with Metro as our partner to meet and achieve accreditation with the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare and we uh, believe that we're gonna have an accreditation uh, review in the fourth quarter of this year. With regards to COVID, we remain vigilant in dealing with COVID crisis, which presents an ongoing threat to our inmates and employees alike, especially as the variants continue to roll through. Our COVID protocols and restrictions are still in place, the same ones that we put into place in the beginning of 2020. These include quarantine, isolation, and exposure practices. And we continuously work with Metro and the courts to identify and deal with the inmates who are currently at the most high levels of risk. Uh, Dr. Bruner was not uh, uh, incorrect in saying that on a weekly basis, this list is being provided to the courts so that we can assess those individual cases to meet the needs of those inmates as rapidly as possible. Uh, she also indicated that we have begun an inmate vaccination incentive program. 
Inmates are going to be receiving the equivalent of $50 in either a bag of commissary items, telephone time, or video visitation time once they become fully vaccinated. And I believe that program is set to roll out later this week. And then I believe Dr. Bruner may have addressed the uh, specific data request you had with regards to COVID itself. Inmate population issues, <clears throat> to Mr. Miller's earlier question. The inmate population in jail for the last week has been between 1,600 and 1,650. This does not include the over 500 offenders who we've removed from the jail by being able to monitoring, monitor them with electronic monitoring systems. This is an increase of approximately 200 on a daily basis compared to earlier this year, March. And it's consistently the largest category of inmates in the jail is those who are incarcerated awaiting trial. That's generally between 75 and 80% of our total population. As you know, inmates are incarcerated in the jail by the order of the court or by law enforcement with approval of a prosecutor. The sheriff is only the steward of those that are ordered incarcerated. The sheriff has no independent authority to hold or release those in custody. And my primary duty is simply to ensure that our inmates are held humanely until their next required court action or completion of sentence. Therefore, the jail administrative staff and I meet at least weekly with the court's representative, the clerk's office, the prosecutor, the public defender, probation, and any other involved stakeholders that we can think of with the sole goal of ensuring that only those that must be in jail remain in jail. According to the numbers provided by Common Pleas Court, over 75% of their pretrial detainees are incarcerated for murder or violent aggravated felonies of the first or second degree. These are offenders that would be dangerous to release and do require incarceration. When we originally purged the jails back in 2020, those nonviolent offenders were released and are not being accepted to this day. Our staff is booking roughly 75 new intakes per day and releasing as many as ordered, and it's just short of 75 at this time, which causes a slow growth. Generally, half of those released are leaving on bond. With regard to contraband control, uh, we continue to strategize methods to be vigilant regarding contraband control in the jail. As you know, our dedicated jail canines are working throughout the week doing cell checks, checking incoming mail, and responding to various incidents. We are preparing to open full body scanners for all employees at jail access in the next month or so, so as to dissuade any employees or volunteers from any bad acts bringing contraband into the jail. We're also in the process of contracting to have non-legal jail mail scanned and available to inmates directly on tablets. However, that process has been put on temporary hold while the FCC standards and mandates are being amended. Unfortunately, many of our in-person services have been reduced or restricted due to COVID separation and isolation requirements. As I stated, our long-term plan is to have a tablet or pad available for each individual inmate as soon as the FCC rules are finalized. Inmates will have individual and direct access to messaging and email services, entertainment, available inmate services, filings, and forms for requests, et cetera. We continue to work with the Northeast Ohio Voting Advocates Association and the Board of Elections to ensure that those who are eligible to vote can register and vote in every election. We started a new program of allowing vaccinated inmates to have access to the gym by signing up and being screened regardless of the status of their pod and with the hope that this alleviates some of the stressors from lack of other services. We just completed the first year of our food service contract with Trinity Services Group. And unfortunately, as noted earlier, we do not have all the necessary hardware and equipment installed for them to provide full services. Our dishwashing and oven equipment is still in process. Unfortunately, there have been some small issues with some Trinity, Trinity personnel as some have had to be removed from service in the jail. We'll have much better accountability systems in place, and I'll be able to provide for you a more thorough report once Trinity has the ability to reach full operational capacity. As you all know, staffing is our primary issue right now. We do not currently have enough staff to run all of the programs in the jail and many of our employees are covering multiple duties in order to get the mission done. We're working zealously with County Human Resources Talent Acquisition 
constantly to provide strategies and ideas to help recruit and retain quality employees. It is unfortunate that we're in a nationwide period of employee shortages in all fields. That's coupled with the additional reduction in employment candidates throughout the U.S. that are looking for any kind of career in law enforcement. This is not a result directly of any action or lack thereof from counsel or the executive. It simply is the environment that we find ourselves in. We are adequately funded and we are fully supported in anything that we attempt to do. We simply cannot get qualified candidates on board. In 2021, we hired 73 corrections officers and have been able to promote nine new corrections corporals. A promotional exam for corrections sergeants has been completed and we expect open positions there to be filled soon. That being said, we still have over 100 vacancies for corrections officers that are fully funded and need to be filled. We're taking the following steps to help with that effort. Uh, we have staff that are assisting HR and attending in-person job fairs and employment information desks in person now, which we haven't been able to do over the last year. We have started with various different changes in advertising methods, including print and other media. We're producing a recruitment video using our own employees to help make our message known. I have requested a change in legislation that may come before you soon regarding when certain information can be requested in the employment process from applicants to ensure that our process efforts are much more efficient and timely. I want to express my great appreciation to counsel and the executive you recently negotiated and you approved uh, possible or changes to the corrections officer's contract in order to increase salary and incentivize possible candidates. The union also agreed to certain contract provisions that would be of assistance to management with regards to incentivizing perfect attendance and maintaining contraband control. I think this single significant change has the best chance of increasing our staff in the short term. However, we will continue to work diligently with HR on other types of incentives and recruitment tools at any step that we can find them. We've also added resources to assist our current staff, including new positions of job coach to ensure proper support to staff in all aspects of employment. And again, with appreciation to counsel and the executive, uh, recently approved legislation which changed the benefits for the position of corrections lieutenant and which will allow us to promote four new positions whose sole focus will be in direct support of jail security staff. Jail administrative staff collaborates on a daily basis to direct available resources as effectively and efficiently as possible. And we work continuously with county HR in support of their efforts to recruit additional help. We fully expect to go through a complete Bureau of Adult Detention inspection in the fourth quarter of this year, and we feel as if we're well prepared for that. Thank you for your time. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. And we'll stay here as long as we need to to get everybody's concerns answered. And I see people are already chomping at the bit, but sure. what took me by surprise is Trinity, uh, when they went through the bidding process. Everybody came through, looked at our equipment, and bid based on what they saw. And what they saw is what they saw. And all of a sudden, they get in there, and now they're saying what they saw is not what they need? I don't believe that's the case, but since that prior to my time, I can't right. give you you're, a specific You're in kind yeah. of a yeah. funky thing here. but uh, and, I, and I don't want to even hypothesize, because I may be wrong. But I can see, I can envision a situation where equipment may have failed or equipment may not be what was thought to be, where in fact it wasn't. I'll, I'll get into that yep. later. Not, not an issue. Um, I see. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thanks, Sheriff, so much for your work. I have a question to address the sentiment that the efforts to keep the jail population down have waned. That's not what I'm hearing. I, what I'm hearing is that the nonviolent offenders are being turned away from the jail and those who pose a risk are are now in 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 the jail is that a correct correct so i i would say i would respond in this way the jail population is growing slowly uh, looked at just with raw numbers it might appear as if we have become less zealous in trying to ensure that that population stayed down uh, what in fact i believe is happening is that while we had, for all intents and purposes, cleared the decks a year ago, um, courts were not in full operation. We weren't able to successfully move the volume through the system that should have been moved through the system. Um, 
the people who are currently incarcerated are not people who should be either on electronic monitoring or on bond. Um, and we, uh, believe me, we on a weekly basis have long conversations with the judge and with all involved stakeholders and try to pick at small different categories of inmate to strategize whether this is the type of thing that we can find another solution for. Uh, it's very difficult to do in the environment that we're in. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, sometimes my uh, only ability is to be coercive or to, to help uh, provide strategies, um, but it takes buy-in from 34 elected judges as well as other people to get significant movement. Uh, but I want to assure you all, each individually, that if there is somebody that is incarcerated that should not be incarcerated because there is a better means of handling them, that the jail administrative staff is on the phone to that individual judge, and it is my desire to get those people out. This is not a situation where we're just willing to statically warehouse whoever gets sent our way. We don't operate that way. Sheriff, thank you so much for clarifying that as well. The grand jury was dis disbanded during COVID, so there were no indictments. So this is that was an aberrant year which doesn't reflect now that there's this increase because there's people in jail who shouldn't be. Thank you for clarifying that. And there's a councilman, sorry to interrupt, but there are, uh, there's an additional fact of the matter, which is, uh, and Dr. Gilson uh, addressed it is violent crime is on a surge. So over the summer months, the number of people who have been arrested for violent crime has, has gone beyond what anybody expected. Uh, so those numbers, just in volume alone, have impacted our, our... And lastly, I have to say that at least two of the communities I represent are getting very frustrated that some of the people they pick up, if the offenders, are not able to come into our jail. And, and so I really hope we can continue a dialogue on how to address that. And, and frankly, if they need to be coming into jail, they need to come into jail because the streets... Um, of some of these communities are at risk and, mm -hmm. and there's a balance that we need to reach instead of just saying don't come in because it's not as violent as the next. That's true. Uh, Sheriff Schilling's uh, prior order restricting uh, misdemeanor and sentenced uh, prisoners to the jail is still in effect. I have not rescinded that. We do work with um, local municipal courts uh, when they identify those people who uh, have violent uh, issues, domestic violence issues, and, and we do allow those in on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but I certainly understand uh, the need of the suburban communities to for housing that we're currently unable to provide. And uh, to me, the biggest issue at this point in time isn't necessarily jail population size as much as it is still the COVID threat and the fact that we are back spiking up to where we hadn't been in a long time. And um, bringing in uh, any inmate uh, that's not necessary just increases the threat. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, to the sheriff, uh, thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, as far as the, um, you kind of mentioned a lot of cooks in the kitchen, and I, under, I understand where you're coming from on that, but who do you deal with directly when discussing um, intake and, and who's, who's coming into the, the jail as far as the population as to who is considered violent in Obviously, we know murderous offenders. We understand that. Um, but who is it that you're actually dealing with in those conversations? So we, on a weekly basis, uh, meet with uh, the administrative judge of the courts, Judge Sheehan, mm -hmm. Prosecutor O'Malley, Public Defender Cullen Sweeney, uh, uh, municipal judges, uh, Judge Early. We have um, clerk of courts, both Cleveland clerk of courts as well as county clerk of courts. Um, I know that I'm missing somebody because it's a large room and it's a large Zoom call, but these are all people who are directly involved in either uh, the order to incarcerate or assistance in releasing. Uh, and we, we discuss on a weekly basis what the numbers are, uh, what effect COVID is having on those numbers, what the proposed transport of inmates out of the facility is, either to uh, halfway houses, other places of uh, containment, or to the ODRC directly. Uh, and we try to strategize various different methodologies by which we can attack the issue. The most recent one is the one that Dr. Bruner uh, came up with, and it's on her request uh, that she has identified the most at-risk 
uh, employees and those numbers are not being provided directly to Judge Sheehan and the courts so that they can assess those cases individually to make changes if necessary. Are you, are you satisfied with the um, dialogue that you get and you think you're getting fair, you know, fair assessments or, in, in, you know, I, I'm not, again, I'm not asking you to be very specific with any particular individual, but are, do you think overall you're getting fair assessments or do you think, um, you know, you're not seeing the numbers go the way that you'd like them to, to go realistically? I think that the stakeholders who are involved are all working to the correct goal and they're working very hard. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the roadblocks is in the volume of cases that is in the courts, the restrictions that are on the courts for having trials, the ability for uh, judges to manage their dockets in a way which would be of positive impact to us. Um, yeah, I think, so, that, I think yeah, that answers your question. A little bit of dealing with the realities of the number of cases coming in is, is hampering that a little bit. But it's, it sounds to me like at least to, Top down, there's an understanding of, of what we're trying to do. Oh, absolutely, you know. there is. The the um, I think when the numbers went down to a thousand way back in 2020, that was an artificially depressed number. Right. I think when we got back up to the 13 and 1400s, which is right about before I came on board, uh, I think that that could maybe have been a sustainable number if we didn't hit a crime surge throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. that we can't address the volume for. So the fact that we're up to 1,600 or so uh, is explainable despite people's efforts, I think. Right, understood. And do you think, th do you think there's been enough emphasis with the stakeholders with respect to, you know, um, mental health training and, and diversion center and things like that? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, prosecutor, prosecutor O'Malley just made public to all the various suburban police departments that uh, they have his uh, guidance and discretion in terms of moving uh, felony four and felony five offenders who are nonviolent directly to the diversion center, depending on how the suburb chooses to handle that or right. the municipality chooses to handle that. So uh, the fact that the diversion center is now there and open and has the blessing of all of these stakeholders, we are making every attempt to get uh, these people who don't necessarily need to be incarcerated Right. That alternate facility. The other thing that we're really hoping is another piece of the puzzle was the central booking project. So as that wraps up with completion and we start full operation of that next year, the hope is is that those stakeholders will be physically at that location to divert people out of the jail population if they can. Right, and I've I've been privy to to uh, attend s several of those meetings via Zoom over the past year and a half, and I know um, Mr. Curry and Mr. Mason are working hard on that. Um, when when is the anticipated uh, start date on the that? Of, the, the, the construction should be done by the end of the fourth quarter, so as we move into next year. Okay, I think that might help with the processing. It would least, hope. So, yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate it, and um, you know, uh, council's always here if you need Absolutely, yes, assistance. sir. Okay, yes, sir. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Chairman and the council president have both made that very clear, and I appreciate the fact that you said that. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on um, Councilman Tuma's questions, the diversion center, do you see the potential of um, keeping the existing uh, diversion center? Do you, do you see the uh, potential of keeping the existing diversion center, uh, even if we have a, a newer facility as well? Uh, to be honest with you, Mr. President, I don't know enough about the statistics and the volume that they're dealing with to have a, a good answer for you. I apologize. I may not need to ask my next question. How do you see the um, use of the existing uh, uh, diversion center? Are, yeah, so, are the so police, is it growing? Or? Yeah, the way that it currently operates, those people are diverted to the diversion center before they even reach us. So we don't have any knowledge of gotcha. what that volume is. We don't have any way to know that. Those would be questions better addressed to the executive. Your insight is more into those that you currently have that can be sent to the diversion That's the center. goal. The, the goal of central booking would be to the people who do make it to us, if we can still find a way to divert them, that would be the, the primary goal. Did you have a number so far on, on how many you have been able to transition? We, ha we have not. They don't. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's so not they, happening currently but until central number. booking comes up and running. Sure, if I, you wouldn't know yeah. the, the number is I think about 60. Until we get Cleveland on board, it's going to be a struggle 
So, you know, our experts that we hired with the Justice Center Jail Project are, I think, they, I think their projected number was between 100 and 150, hopefully, that would take them out of the jail. Um, but we don't know yet. And, and until we get everybody comfortable, we're not going to really get a number yet. So, okay. I, I still contend 24-7 booking is going to be going to be the thing and until we get that everything else is still flowing. and I would agree with that assessment and that is absolutely the hope yes sir. I appreciate your earlier comments about the um, uh, I guess low-level offenders and mm -hmm. and staying on the on the judges so to speak to help that process move along um, are you also sharing with us the number of the, the, not just the total inmate, which I see on our, on our weekly update, mm -hmm. um, but a distinction between the number of low-level offenders and those that are more high-level. Um, can we? Uh, do you drill down in detail to that degree where we so, can be so I would, transparent and, and I see think those I, numbers? Yeah, I think I understand your question, and, and the short answer to that would be no, and the reason that that would be is that uh, most of the low-level offenders, the type I think that you're referring to, would be people who are already released on bail. So we wouldn't, we don't track the numbers of the people who are in the bail system for the court. We are only concerned with the people who we have physical custody of. So at some point you have the low level offenders in your custody? Only, after, only as they would come in for processing and release. And they're there just like if it's the weekend, they might be there a little longer, but you're saying during the week it's a, a quick process. Generally, generally, and and it, well, and it's a matter of when they can post the bond. So they may have to wait a couple of days for somebody to be able to come up with the bond to post for them. So uh, the waiting period for bond is very dependent upon the individual case, uh, but it can be as quickly as a, a intake and a processing and release, or it can take sometimes days, if not weeks, for somebody to be able to come up with the resources for bond. So can I assume that the number that we get on our weekly update? of the uh, inmate population is actually, um, it, it doesn't capture the low level. It, it, it captures them in that respect. So the people who are incarcerated and may be waiting on bond are in those numbers. So if, if, if we use round numbers, and please don't hold me to these because this is just gonna be a generality. Uh, but if we say that the inmate population is 1600, uh, then I will tell you that in general, between 1,250 and 1,300 of the inmates are pretrial detainees that are not being released on, that can't make bail, won't make bail. They're waiting for their next court date, the common pleas court. That leaves about 250, 300 inmates, and that's the fluctuation of the people that we're arresting that perhaps Cleveland doesn't charge, the people that we're arresting who will make bond and be out of it. There's a, there's a small number at the bottom of that that's fairly consistent that's just general uh, evolution of people entering and leaving the system on a fairly quick basis. I think I understand what you're saying. Those, those numbers, they're, they're low level, but they just move through the system very quickly, but they are captured in your They are your captured in those name. numbers, yes, sir. So, so by, I would still come back to my original question. Couldn't you still tease it out for us? And just so we can, you know, so we get a more clear, more detailed picture. I'll take a look at the what I have available data-wise. Um, yes, sir, I will do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We'll be going. I could just ask you to get me the information. There's 500 people on the ankle bracelets. Could you get me that number pre-COVID, COVID, and then now? Because that should be added to the 16, 1700. Not that they're in jail, yep. but they're in custody. Ms. Baker and Mr. Miller. Thank you, and that was part of my question, is going back to the 500 that were on the ankle bracelets. There was a time when we had discussions about the ankle bracelets and they were being used for probation period and not for pretrial. Is there any concern or that there aren't enough of the ankle bracelets to give that, I believe you said at the top, you had about 75% of the current inmates are high level crimes that can't be released, mm -hmm. but that leaves 25% of maybe that piece that you were just describing. Is there any concern that you don't have enough of the ankle bracelets in order to 
accommodate those that you could release? We, that's not an obstacle, is it? I don't believe that that's an obstacle based upon what I know. We have just contracted uh, with a electronic monitoring system to continue our current contract. And as part of that, uh, I plan on looking at those numbers to make a determination of when and if uh, we can increase that and if that's appropriate given the caseload of the common police courts. The issue, however, would not simply be a matter of um, purchasing ankle bracelets. Uh, there, there is an issue of staffing and manpower, et cetera, because those are people who we have in a control center, in a control center being monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and very often having to respond out to uh, facilities with deputies or to residences with deputies. So um, at this point, I don't believe we have people who would be eligible in a large number who are not able to service, but as this contract rolls out, I'll have more information on that. 25% of a $1,600 population would be about 400. Mm -hmm. So that could take you down to, to 1,200. Of course, in that perfect world, I understand. Yeah. It's not, not a perfect world. Um, and the diversion center too, I'd like to know more about that when you're able to let us know how that too can cut away at that perhaps 1,600, maybe that 25% of what we're talking about. Uh, I think. I think, as the chair said, I, th I think that the projections were somewhere between 100 and 150. Okay. okay. But Thank any and and but I will say to you, Councilwoman, that uh, every time we sit down and relook at the numbers and we relook at the population, uh, sometimes we argue about 40 or 50 people. If that and 40 or 50 people is enough for us to have an argument about how to get that category addressed. So any amount is something that we're absolutely looking at all the time. One final question, if I may. Are you rethinking the capacity of a new jail? Are you rethinking at this point that if we're at 1650 now with 500 on electric monitors and of that 75%, you probably wouldn't change anyway? Are you rethinking that perhaps that number should be increased so based I, on the spikes that we now yeah, are seeing? I have been a participant in several meetings with uh, owner's representative and some of the stakeholders and Councilman Gallagher has been at some of these meetings and I will say that at this point in time uh, those numbers are absolutely being assessed for accuracy and for uh, projections moving into the future absolutely okay all right thank you actually Thursday those will be addressed so we'll get a better idea Mr. Miller Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman Sheriff uh, I'd just like to follow up on one question that you responded to uh, Councilman Tuma and and uh, it's regarding the function the functioning of the court system and I'm we're talking about the 1250 to 1300 that are pre-trial mm -hmm. and uh, and the way to move those people along is for there to be a trial and, and a resolution through trial or else for there to be a plea agreement and some kind of a settlement on the disposition. And and I got the sense from what you're saying that that the courts are not yet operating at a at a pre COVID level in terms of their capability to uh uh process cases and my question is that is that correct uh, I believe that is correct I still believe that uh, we are utilizing the global center as a jury collection point because we can't meet COVID mm. protocols with when bringing in juries so when they do call trials uh, having juries available is still uh, one of the roadblocks uh, and I I would defer to the administrative judge and the, and the uh, the court clerk and the court administrator with regards to how they're otherwise processing these trials, but I would uh, I would say that absolutely they're not up to where they were pre-COVID at this point. So, Mr. Chairman, to the sheriff, if if, uh, if at some point we're able to return to that pre-level, pre-COVID level of processing uh, cases that might create some possibility to create a sustainably lower number of population. Is that correct? I would say it would create a sustainably even number. I don't know that it would be lo significantly lower than where we are. And I, I would say that it will never be as low as it was uh, March, April of last year. So 
Mr. Chairman, to the sheriff, I'm not talking about getting to, down to a thousand or something, anything like that. But but uh, it would seem that if the courts are able to process more cases through the system, e either by holding trials or or, uh, or working out agreements, that that sh that should enable you to move more people along and and uh, and uh, reduce the numbers somewhat. That's true, but I'll go back to the comments made by Councilwoman Simon, and that is that I am still running a very restricted facility. There are uh, sentenced inmates and other inmates that we should, in a normal situation, be taking that we're currently not taking. And those numbers are in the hundreds, and so those will probably counterbalance any of the gains that we make with efficiency in the court system. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Okay, I see our, our, we're past time, and Ms. Baker has her committee coming up. I think there are some more uh, questions that we might have, so we might bring it back in a couple weeks. Absolutely. I do want to really get into touching on recruitment. Absolutely. And uh, I would and, request, Mr. Chairman, that we bring in uh, or that we invite uh, county HR and talent acquisition as they are an integral part of all of that. Oh, issues. absolutely. But I think I think you as sheriff should have somebody on your staff at least part time, maybe full time or maybe there are more than one that maybe there's a retired uh, law enforcement individual that can go out into the communities that we need to hit and start recruiting these kids out of high school and, and start in college, especially at the community college level, because quite honestly, I don't see the HR doing that. They're recruiting in different directions. Yours is spe special and specific. And I, and I, as we're up in the pay, I think it becomes more attractive, but we have to get that word out. And I think you should control that. Uh, I don't think you should be beholden to HR. I think that's one of the problems that we've had is that everything goes through HR and everything else and it's a black hole and I've said my piece on that. I think you need to take more control of this. If that's the direction you want to go, I think it's a good idea. I think I can talk my colleagues into that, but we will discuss that further probably in two weeks. Okay. Um, other than that, do we have anything else? We're adjourned. Thank you all.